Welcome to Course 2, Unit 3, Lesson 4, Warren Buffett's Third Rule, A Stock Must Be Stable and Understandable. In this lesson, we have two lesson objectives. The first lesson objective is to understand why stability is important for determining the intrinsic value. And the second lesson objective is why is it important to invest in a company that you understand. So let's get started. So we've made it to the third rule, a stock must be stable and understandable. Um, all four of these rules must be met. So let's go ahead and learn a little bit more about this particular rule. So we have a uh, person named Andrew, and we've been tracking Andrew's equity earnings and debt uh, for the last 10 years from 2002 to 2012. And what we're going to do is we're just going to assess Andrew in each one of those areas, the equity, the earnings, and his debt uh, that he's managed over the last 10 years for himself. This is not a company. This is just Andrew. Okay, so when we look at Andrew's equity over the last 10 years, we see that it's had its ups and its downs, um, and generally it's, it's moved in the upward direction. When we look at his earnings, uh, which you can see the chart, the, the numbers on the left, and then you can see it graphically represented on the right, those are his earnings. Um, you can see that they've generally grown, but they've kind of had their ups and downs as well. And recently in the last five years, it's been kind of steady and level. Then when we look at his debt, his debt's kind of all over the place. It's been high, it's been low, um, and it's generally kind of stayed at the same level, which is kind of high compared to how much equity he had. So the point that I'm getting at with this is if we were going to predict how much equity Andrew would have in the year 2022, it might be a little bit hard for us to determine that based off of his past performance. Now that doesn't mean that in the future he could just start having very sustained equity growth, he could have very sustained earnings, uh, very consistent, every year was pretty much the same. Uh, that could happen, but most likely that won't happen. Uh, this type of person will continue to live this, this style, this lifestyle, and he's going to have those ups and downs most likely in the future, which makes predicting how much he's going to be worth, because that's really what this is, his, his equity is his net worth. Um, if he would liquidate or he would die, uh, Andrew's assets would be added up and then subtracting out his liabilities, that would be his equity. But predicting how much equity he would have in 10 years from now might be a little bit difficult based off of his previous uh, lifestyle and the way that he lives his life. So let's look at a different person. Let's assume that we're going to look at a woman named Linda. Now Linda lives a completely different way than Andrew. And Linda has, we're looking to assess her equity, earnings, and debt. And when we look at her equity, you can see that her equity grows very steadily every single year, um, almost by the same margin. And it's a very linear graph when we look at that equity graph. So as we look at Linda, um, let's say we wanted to estimate how much equity she would be worth in 10 years from now. Um, I think everyone can agree that would be a lot easier to estimate where Linda would be compared to Andrew. So as we look at these two people, the thing that I want you to take away from this uh, scenario is that businesses are managed just like individual people. The business that we want to find and that we want to invest in is that business that is very steady, very predictable, because when, we, when we're trying to figure out the intrinsic value of a business, we're going to be adding up all the cash that we could take out of the business over a 10-year period. And when we're making that assessment, it's very difficult to do when you have a business that moves like Andrew opposed to a business that moves like Linda. So just because a business has volatile numbers doesn't mean it won't make a lot of money in the future. That's not my, my point of, of pointing this out to you. Um, Andrew could be worth 10 times as much as Linda in the future. But the, the reason I, I show this is because Andrew is unpredictable. You can't really predict where he's going to be, where Linda, you have a much better idea of where she's going to be. And so that difficulty to predict that value of where something's going to be in the future, that's risk. And what we're trying to do is minimize our risk while still having uh, some decent returns. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you some real companies, not these uh scenarios with individual people. I'm going to show you uh, Disney and XM Radio again. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at their equity, we're going to look at their debt to equity, and we're going to look at their earnings and see how it's progressed over the last 10 years. And then what we're going to do is uh, compare the two. So I'm going to go to MSN Money and I'm going to first pull up uh, Cirrus XM Radio.
Okay, so here we are at the top page for msn.com, and we're just going to come down to enter our ticker, and we're going to enter Sirius XM Radio, which is S-I-R-I, -I, and we'll hit enter. Okay, and it takes us to this top-level page um, where it gives us all of our information. Now, one of the tools I really like on MSN uh, Money is being able to go back and look at the 10-year trends. So to do that, you're going to come over here to the left-hand side under Key Ratios, and we'll go ahead and click there. And then at the top up here, it has a 10-year summary, and we'll click on that. When it brings up this 10-year summary, we can come down here, and we're going to look at the book value per share and how it's changed for Sirius XM Radio over the last 10 years. So, and you'll see it says book value per share. And if you go back into the first course, if you're, if you're not familiar with this, you're probably going to have to go back to the first course. Um, it was under Course 1, Unit 1, Lesson 3, uh, where we learned about book value. And all that is is equity per share. So we're really looking at the equity of the business and how it's changing over a 10-year period. So when we look at Cirrus, we can see back in 2002, it was worth $7.33 a share. And then the next year, it went down to $1.16. And you can see that progression and how that number really dipped uh, an enormous amount. And then in the last three years, they've been just slowly making some growth in their equity. Okay, the next number over, if you remember from uh, Warren Buffett's first rule where we were talking about the debt to equity ratio, this gives you the debt to equity ratio for the, the average of the debt to equity ratio for uh, each year. So this is a really uh, great number to look at. So you can see the trend and how this company's been managing their debt over the last 10 years. And you can see, if you remember, we want to find a business that has a debt to equity below a 0.5. When we look at Cirrus, they've got some very high numbers, even some negative equity right here. That's what would make this, uh, this number a negative. Um, so those numbers are very high, and that's something that you'd really want to avoid if you were going to be investing in this company. Now, as far as the earnings per share, which you'll remember from uh, Course 1, Unit 1, Lesson 2, uh, that's a very important number because that's essentially your profit per share. So in order to find that, unfortunately, it's not on this chart, but we can go to right over here on the left where it says 10-year summary. And if you click on that, it's going to show you the EPS right here. And this is the trend for the last 10 years. So you can see the earnings on Cirrus XM Radio, negative $6 a share, negative $0.38 cents a share, negative $0.57, or $0.57 cents a share. And it goes clear up to here. Only recently in the last two years have they had a positive earnings per share with $0.01 cent and $0.07. Cents. Okay, So that's the trend of this company. And, and what I'm going to do now is I'm going to show you how that would look on a graph if we plotted all those numbers that I just showed you. So I've plotted out two of the uh, numbers here. I've plotted out the equity for Cirrus, and I've plotted out the debt-to-equity ratio. So when we look at the equity, you can see that on that chart, um, that's not a good trend. Whenever you're looking at equity, you want it to be going in a positive direction, not a negative direction. Um, and not only do you want it to be going in a positive direction, but you want that chart to be really linear. Because the more linear that it is, the more predictable it is for you to assess how much that equity is going to grow over the next 10 years. Now, when we look at the debt to equity for uh, Cirrus, unfortunately, uh, the, the debt to equity was so high in 2008 that the chart, you really can't even see how those values were fluctuating that much for all the other years. But um, to, to go from a 15.5 in 2010 down to a 4.28 in 2011, those are enormous changes in that debt for that company. And that's something that you want to avoid at all costs is a company that is moving in all these different directions like Cirrus is. So when we're trying to predict the intrinsic value of this company, that's exceptionally hard to do because in the past, the, the company's been all over the place. Um, it's just so sporadic that you can't come up with an intelligent estimate of what you think this company would do over the next 10 years. It, it's hard enough to predict what they're going to do in the next year, let alone 10 years. So if I was going to be trying to calculate the intrinsic value of Cirrus, I would have absolutely stopped right here. I would have never even gone to the calculator, which you're going to learn about in the next lesson. Um, this, this would have been the end of the road for me with this stock. So now let's go ahead and take a look at uh, the numbers for Disney, 
So let's go ahead and go back to MSN Money and we'll pull up the Disney numbers and then I'll show you the uh, charts for that. Okay, so here we are for the Walt Disney Company, which their ticker is DIS. Um, and you just type that in here at the top, you type in DIS and it'll take you to this page. And just like we did before, we're just gonna scroll down and we're gonna come over here to the Key Ratios tab. We're gonna go ahead and click that. Then we're gonna go up to the 10 year summary. Okay, and it takes us to this page. Now, when we look at the book value, which is just the equity per share, um, you can see that in 2002, the equity was $11, 11.8, goes up to 13. You see this nice steady trend. That's exactly what you're looking for whenever you're trying to find a business. Now, when we look at the debt to equity, we can see that Disney has generally managed their debt below a 0.5, which is exactly the number that we want to see it underneath. Now let's go over to look at the earnings. So to do that, we have to click on the 10 year summary. We'll click there. And now we're going to look at the earnings per share. This is generally trending. It started off at 60 cents 10 years ago, and now it's up to $2 and 50 cents. And you can see that is trending up. It keeps increasing. And that's exactly what you want to see with your earnings. You always want to see your earnings increasing like that if possible. But at a minimum, if the earnings are consistent, let's say it was $2 and 50 cents for all 10 years, that's wonderful. Um, when you see it growing, even better. So let's go ahead and chart, and let's, let's put all these numbers on a chart so we can graphically see what those numbers are doing. Okay, so on the left, we have the equity for uh, Disney, and you can see that is a nice linear graph over the last 10 years, and you can see how they're growing that equity. When you have a, a company that's growing their equity nice and consistent like that, you're going to see that reflected in the market price. The market price is generally going to trend exactly with the equity. Um, now the debt, you can see that um, back in the early 2000s, they had it a little bit above a 0.5, but recently in the last five years, they've maintained it below a 0.5, and it's all been trending in a downward direction. So that's, that's obviously really good as well. So if we're looking at a company that's stable, now I'm not saying that this is a company that you should buy because we still have to figure out what it's worth. But if we're trying to predict where this company is going to be in 10 years, I think we can all agree that this is going to be so much easier to predict than a company like Cirrus. Now, in 10 years from now, Cirrus XM Radio might be the best company on the universe and Disney might be the worst. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to be able to predict which company is going to be where in 10 years from now. And based off of these charts and based off of these important numbers, we can see that, that Disney is much more stable and calculable than uh, Cirrus XM Radio. So in this rule, uh, we not only want to have a stable business, but we want to have a business that we understand. For me personally, I've never really understood the XM Radio thing. Um, it's hard for me to understand why people would want this service. Now, I have friends that swear by this uh, company and they love the service. But for me, it's not something that I really particularly care for and something that I would obviously not invest in. I don't understand it. So for me, this is probably a really bad business to own because it's not something if, say they change their service and it's no longer something that's, that's what a lot of people like. I wouldn't know that because I don't subscribe to this. I don't use it. So that's not something that I would be attuned to uh, if I owned this company. So you generally want to stay away from a company that you really don't understand because you're not going to really understand the ins and outs of the direction that the company is moving. Now, as far as Disney, I've been there a few times and I'm very impressed with their product. Uh, I think that it's a viable product. I think it's going to be a product that's going to be around for years to come. And so I somewhat understand this. So if the numbers would check out and let's say that Disney would be a good buy, then this would be a company that I would be comfortable buying. This part of the rule is something that a lot of people might not follow and I would strongly discourage you from that because it's I think it's really important to understand the businesses that you actually own. So this concludes our uh, third rule. Um, a stock must be stable and understandable and hopefully uh, those tools that I showed you on MSN Money will come in handy. Um, make sure you go back there and try that with a couple different companies so you can uh, look at how that equity is grown which is the book value. Uh, you can look at that earnings per share and see how that's trending. And you can also go back and look at that debt to equity and apply that to a lot of the lessons that we learned in, in Warren Buffett's first rule, which a stock must be managed by vigilant leaders. So the next lesson where we're going to talk about how a stock must be undervalued, 
Uh, we're going to be finally figuring out the intrinsic value of a, a business using the Buffett's Books Calculator. So this concludes Course 2, Unit 3, Lesson 4, Warren Buffett's Third Rule, A Stock Must Be Stable and Understandable. We learned why stability is important for determining the intrinsic value, and we learned why it was important to invest in a company that you understand. So I really look forward to seeing you guys in the next lesson where we figure out the intrinsic value of a company.